Jesus committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Well, welcome, brothers and sisters and visitors of Sylvania Anglican Church. My name is Andy Clark. I'm one of the ministers here. Uh, and it's well, a great welcome to you on this special day, this day that is both terrible and wonderful. Humanity's darkest hour and its brightest light. For when Jesus, the Son of God, was killed, he was killed to bring us home. That's what we're remembering. And that's what we're celebrating as we gather together today on this Good Friday. And we're going to begin our time together today in song. Uh, this time led by the organ. Uh, so wherever you are, let me encourage you to lift your voice, to rouse your neighbours and let's remember together the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Please join us. Let's sing together. because of who God is and what he's done. And so let's declare together the truth that unites us as brothers and sisters in Christ as we say together the Apostles' Creed. So would you join me? 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, we're now going to watch a short animation together. Uh, Christ loved us. Watch this. <laughs> Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He did this to show the full extent of his love. But that was not all. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He did this to show the full extent of his love, but that was not all. Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs. They were sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said rabbi and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then everyone deserted him and fled. He did this to show the full extent of his love, but that was not all. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. He did this to show the full extent of his love, but that was not all. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Jesus did this to show the full extent of his love, but that was not all. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. It was now 
about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain in the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Jesus did all this to show the full extent of his love. Well, it's now time to hear God speak as the Bible is uh, read and taught to us. Uh, so please join me in asking God to help us listen well. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means and the will to put it into practice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to have our Bible readings now. The reading today is from Mark, that's chapter 15 and verses 6 to 20. Mark 15, 6 to 20. Pilate delivers Jesus to be crucified. Now at the feast, Pilate used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. This is the word of the Lord. The Bible reading continues from verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine 
put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Hello everyone, my name is Mark Charleston and God's blessings to you this Easter season. Let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father and Almighty God, we do thank you for Good Friday. We thank you for this special time when we can remember again what it cost you to send your son into the world for sinners. Help me to explain your word faithfully today so that we might be both challenged and comforted by your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Did you notice this year that hot cross buns were sold in our supermarkets only days after Christmas? Now I welcome this, contrary to some. I welcome it because I like hot cross buns. But I also welcome it because it helps Christians to make a connection between Christmas and Easter. I welcome it because it helps us as Christians to connect Good Friday and Christmas. Christians believe that Jesus was born at Christmas so that he could die at Easter, or on Good Friday to be precise. He was placed in a wooden manger so that 33 years later, he might die on a wooden cross. That's why the cross, rather than the manger of Jesus, is the symbol of the Christian faith. Now, I realise that this motivation is hardly the motivation for our supermarkets in the selling of hot cross buns. Yet it's a connection that we must help our world to see. Because our world is determined to separate Christmas Day from Good Friday. The more distant Good Friday is from Christmas Day, the more comfortable our world is with Jesus Christ. And we can understand why. For to, to closely associate Good Friday with Christmas can remind us of our sin. To closely associate Good Friday with Christmas can remind us of God's righteous judgment that we deserve. It reminds us that we have failed both individually and corporately in the running of our lives and in the running of the world. But the symbol of the cross on a hot cross bun seems bizarre, doesn't it? To have a cross, a symbol of execution all over a pastry, it ought to be as unsettling in our minds as the symbol of an electric chair or the symbol of a hangman's noose on a pastry. Because crucifixion in the ancient world was the worst of all possible deaths. It was so bad that no Roman citizen, even a criminal, could not be crucified if he or she was a Roman citizen because crucifixion was so awful. The Roman writer, Cicero, puts it like this. He says that crucifixion ought to be far removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but even from his thoughts and his gaze and his hearing. However, friends, on Good Friday, we remember that the cross is the precious symbol of our Christian faith. As the Protestant reformer John Calvin puts it, it is at the cross where the glory of God shines brightly. Today we've heard from Mark's Gospel, from the 15th chapter of Mark's Gospel. And we see that the cross of Jesus dominates Mark's story about Jesus. 
In fact, the cross of Jesus dominates Mark's story, his gospel, from beginning to end. Mark, the evangelist, wants us to know what is the proper response to the death of Jesus on that first Good Friday. This morning, we're going to notice the reactions of some of the characters in that narrative. Let's, let's, let's have a look at them together. Firstly, there's the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate is a people pleaser. He's concerned about his image. Notice verse 15. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Pilate's good intentions are set aside when he's faced with opposition from others. And there are people like Pilate today. People who know that there is more to Jesus than what meets the eye. And yet they are more concerned with being people pleasers. They're more concerned about the opinions of others than the good opinion of God himself. Next in Mark's story, we have the soldiers. The soldiers, the Roman soldiers, see nothing special about Jesus. They simply go about their duty. Notice verse 23. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. The main legacy of the cross for the Roman soldiers was the clothing of Jesus. They gamble for his clothes while Jesus dies on that awful cross. But in simply doing their duty as soldiers, they fail to recognise Jesus' death. They fail to recognise the significance of the cross. And again, there are people like that today. Every day in our world, there are people going around doing their duty, whether it's their duty as parents or their duty as employees, going about their everyday lives, ignoring the cross. And then in Mark chapter 15, we have the crowd, or what I call the bystanders. They've just come to the cross of Jesus for the show. Verse 29. Those who passed by derided Jesus, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. The bystanders are totally detached. They are emotionally disconnected from the event of the cross. They are emotionally unmoved. And again, people can be like that today. In fact, people can be like that at church on Good Friday. Totally disconnected from the message of the cross. People can be like that even on church online on Good Friday. Unmoved about the impact of the cross on their lives personally. They don't see that the death of Jesus must change their lives forever. At the cross, we also see the religious leaders. The religious leaders are a horrific sight, really, in the narrative of Mark's story. The religious leaders are self-righteous. They think they know God. They think they have a relationship with God. They think they know the way to God. They have no need of the cross. Verse 31. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. One of the tragic realities in our world is that those who make up their own way to God like these religious leaders, can sometimes be the most vicious enemies 
of God and his son Jesus. But finally, at the cross of Jesus, we have a single nameless figure, the Roman centurion. A man who was the equivalent of a company sergeant major in an army today. He would have seen many men die in his career. However, he realises here at the death of Jesus, at the cross of Jesus, that this death, this particular death was different. Verse 39. And when the centurion who, faced, who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. This nameless centurion gets it right, doesn't he? His is the response that we are called upon to emulate. History tells us that the emperor at the time of Jesus' birth, Emperor Caesar Augustus, was declared to be son of God. Here at the cross of Jesus, three decades after the birth of Jesus, a Roman centurion uses the same title that was ascribed to Augustus and applies it to the crucified Jesus. Why? Because the centurion knew that he was in the presence of a king. And that's the message of Good Friday, isn't it? The message of Good Friday is that here at the cross of Jesus is a king. The king. God's anointed king. God's promised king. God's Messiah. His Christ. And the New Testament goes on to teach that at the cross, God won a great victory for us. A victory made clear for all the world to see when Jesus rose again from the dead on that first Easter day. Our Apostle Paul puts it like this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. He says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Later this year, we will celebrate the 75th anniversary of VE Day, Victory in Europe. Can you see the joy on the faces of these people? Joy on their faces, why? Because VE Day was a day worth celebrating. And likewise, friends, Good Friday is a day of joy. It is a day worth celebrating. We do not rejoice over our sin on Good Friday. We do not rejoice over the transgressions that took our dear and precious Saviour to the cross for us. In fact, Good Friday ought to be marked by self-examination and confession and repentance. And yet, we rejoice also in the victory of the cross on Good Friday. A victory won by the Son of God. Good Friday is more than merely a commemoration. It is a day of humble celebration. As someone once put it, in Christ's disgrace, we find God's grace. In Christ's disgrace, we find God's grace. Because the greatest gift in the world for us was not placed under a Christmas tree. The greatest gift in the world was placed on a tree, on the tree. And that gift is Jesus.
a divine sacrifice, a divine death, a divine victory, confirmed by his resurrection from the grave on that first Easter morning. And so, friends, wherever you are watching church online today, whether in Sylvania, the Shire, Sydney, New South Wales, or elsewhere in Australia, or even in the world, what will your response be to the cross of Jesus this Good Friday, Good Friday 2020? Just as the temple curtain, uh, just as the temple curtain rather, was torn from top to bottom, making the way possible back to God symbolically, so Jesus' death makes it possible for you and I to come into relationship with him. This Easter season is an unusual one, isn't it? Because our thoughts can be dominated. Our thoughts can be dominated by COVID-19, the coronavirus. Can you see the things that look like crowns on the cell of the coronavirus? The word corona is a Latin word meaning crown. But this Easter, we need to remember another crown. We need to remember the crown of thorns that graced the head of Jesus, that symbolised the servant king who died for us and who now reigns victorious at the right hand of the Father and who will come again to judge the living and the dead. This Easter, we need to remember King Jesus who has won the great victory for us over sin and death and judgment, we can put our trust and our faith in him. You can put your trust and your faith in Jesus today and follow him as your king and crown him today as your Lord. I conclude my Good Friday special message to you with words from an Australian woman named Jocelyn Lone. Jocelyn writes this about the coronavirus and Jesus. She says, The virus is called a coronavirus because of the crown-like spikes on the surface of the cell. It's wearing a crown. The virus is a wannabe king. It has the power to make people fear it, to have it rule over their lives. But... We Christians have a far greater king, a far greater king indeed. Praise God for Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to sing again, uh, this time reflecting on the love of God that sent Jesus that he might die for our sin. So would you join me in singing How Deep the Father's Love? Let's sing.
Well, God tells us in Psalm 145 that the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. We're going to spend some time now calling upon our Lord, uh, asking for his provision and care as we pray for our, our leaders, uh, as we pray for our world in light of the coronavirus pandemic, and as we uh, pray for the spread of the good news of Jesus this Easter. Uh, but to begin our time of prayer together, we're going to confess our sin. Uh, in a prayer on the screen, I invite you to join me in praying this confession together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor our neighbour as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbour, and to live for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's continue to pray. Almighty God, ruler of the nations of the earth, please give abundant wisdom, energy and perseverance to the leaders of our country, to our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to our Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, and to all who hold office in this land. Father, especially at this time of crisis, please grant that their decisions may be based on wise counsel so that peace and welfare, truth and justice may prevail among us and make us a blessing to other nations. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the God of all compassion and comfort. We thank you that you listen to our prayers. We pray today for our world as the coronavirus spreads. Please bring help to all our communities according to their needs. Please heal those afflicted and strengthen all who have the responsibility for care. In your mercy, Father, please provide a cure and give wisdom to those seeking to develop a vaccine for this condition. We pray too for ourselves. Enable us to walk by faith. Help us to be careful and wise in taking whatever precautions are necessary to limit and contain the spread of this virus. Please strengthen us to remain calm while vigilant, responsible citizens seeking the welfare of others above ourselves. At times of uncertainty and anxiety, please help our world to look to security in your Son, Jesus Christ, and give courage to Christians as we point others to the one in whom there is always hope. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Father God, we thank you that you so loved the world, that you gave your one and only Son, that whoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. Please God, this Easter, send that good news to all corners of this world. Though we are restrained, your word, your spirit are not restrained. And so we ask through emails, through videos, through TV shows, through phone conversations, through letters and all other means you see fit. Bring Jesus to people and people to Jesus for their salvation and for your glory. We pray all these things knowing that you can do more than we ask or imagine. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, there's a couple of things I'd like to share with you by way of news before we go today. Uh, and the first is I want you to do something for us right now. I want you to take a photo of yourself uh, and whoever you might be watching this with. Uh, take a photo and if you're able, please post it on the comment section on Facebook uh, below this link. Uh, and if that's not possible, please uh, send it to our church office via email because we want to see your faces. Uh, and though we're not together uh, physically, it would be so wonderful uh, to see one another, remembering that we are indeed still family and we are together through all this. So right now, whatever you're doing, take a photo of yourself uh, and with whoever you're with as you watch this church service. Uh, secondly, if you want to know more about Jesus, we would love 
to get in contact with you. If you have some questions, uh, if you'd like to find out more about what's been spoken about today in the talk, uh, first step would be to contact, uh, connect with your friend who sent this link. But if that's not possible, we would love to hear from you. Send an email to our church office so that we might be part of helping you take the next step, uh, whether that be uh, just having a conversation, whether that be providing you with some resources or perhaps even uh, being part of a Christianity Explored course please get in touch. We'd love to chat with you. Uh, third thing to let you know about is to remind you uh, that we'd love to see your giving go online. Uh, again, the details for our church bank account will be up on the screen. And uh, if you're yet to move your giving online, please do so. That would be really helpful. Uh, but the last thing to say as we finish our time together this morning is to say, come back. Come back this Sunday as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection and all that that means for us. So tune in, share the links, pray for those who you are sharing these links with, uh, and we'll see you again this Sunday. But as we go, let me leave you with the words of the grace. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.